Mental health nutrition is the art and science of using supplements and nutrition to stabilize biochemistry and reduce or eliminate mental health symptoms. That includes depression, anxiety, insomnia, bipolar, psychosis. Yes, I have used mental health nutrition for all of these approaches. Why do we need it? Well, here's why. Our clients' symptoms may be biochemical, or they may be emotional, or they may be both. So as therapists, we're trained to see everything through an emotional lens. Let's say we have a client coming in presenting with anxiety and insomnia, right? So we may start off by talking about trauma or a stressful current situation. But if their anxiety and insomnia is due to dysregulated blood sugar, um, is due to uh, low GABA or low serotonin, we can be doing therapy for, for months or years without getting to where we need to go. But if we know these simple natural approaches, we can solve that in, in a matter of hours because that's how quickly your biochemistry changes. Um, so this really makes sense for therapists to know these basics to start, to start their clients off with them. So <clears throat> as I said, I'm a story person. I'm going to start us off with a story. The story that I'm about to tell you is about a dentist named Weston A. Price, who lived in Cleveland at the turn of two centuries ago. And he started to notice that his patients more and more were coming in with a high incidence of cavities and also gum disease. And he theorized very astutely that this may have something to do with diet. Now remember, at this time was the onset, or really kind of getting going, of the Industrial Revolution in America. So a lot was changing socioculturally, and this included our diet. So he had a very unique opportunity. What he did was really interesting. He traveled to six different continents, and what he did was he studied humans in isolated communities who were still consuming their native diets and living in their traditional ways. And he was able to contrast them with their neighbors down the road, which was a similar gene pool, right? Because back then people weren't moving around from all different places. So we know that if people were living fairly close by, they were probably similarly related. Um, but he contrasted them with the neighbors down the road who were living in an industrialized setting and consuming an industrialized diet, what he termed the foods of commerce, which at that time were just white flour and white sugar. That's all, that's the only major change. So what he found was striking. And he wrote a book about it called Nutrition and Physical Degeneration, which is totally worth getting if only for the photos. The photos are worth a thousand words. And um, you can take a look at some of the photos here on the slide. Um, here's what he discovered. The individuals living in their traditional ways, eating their traditional diets, had a much lower incidence of, of cavities and of gum disease, but they also had much stronger, well-formed skulls and skeletons, better bones. They had more peaceable societies, less violence. They were much more resilient uh, physically, like he studied some tribes in Switzerland that would like run for miles through snow in loincloths. Um, and emotionally, they had a lot more stability. When he contrasted this with the neighbors down the road and living in the industrialized setting, consuming the white bread and the, the uh, white sugar, the foods of commerce, he found not only did they have a higher rate of, of cavities and of gum disease, but they also tended to have more violent societies, poor immune function, uh, more caved in um, skulls suggesting malnutrition um, and, and less emotional resilience. Now, of course, there were a lot of differences between these, these two ways of living, living in the indigenous way and living in the modern way than just food, right? And we'll get into that in a moment. But the food was the main thing that was affecting these individuals biochemically. One plus one equals two. Clearly introducing white flour and white sugar has something to do with it. 
So what are the main dietary differences? Well, <clears throat> the foods of commerce, the industrialized food, is not only lacking nutrients, but it is, it is obviously high in, in carbohydrates, in those simple carbs, those highly processed carbs, the white flour and white sugar, but it is also actively depleting. So it's not just low in nutrients, it actually depletes the body when, when you take it in. Contrast this to the traditional food that our ancestors were eating for thousands of years and that the individuals in the still isolated communities that Weston A. Price observed were still consuming. These foods are high in natural fats, protein dense, high in micronutrients, so vitamins and minerals, and in complex carbohydrates, so that's the more whole carbohydrates, like the apples, the broccoli, the, the, the whole grains. So let me tell you a little bit about what's wrong with white flour and white sugar. Why, why were these effects happening to these um, individuals who are consuming them? <clears throat> and to do this, I'm going to zoom out and talk about how um, I hear all the time people saying, why does everybody suddenly have to be gluten-free? Our ancestors ate wheat. What's the problem now, right? Well, the wheat we eat today is really different than the wheat that we ate back in the day. Very, very different. So I'm going to take you through how. The wheat that yours and my ancestors consumed, first of all, was bred for low gluten content. So gluten is a small amount of protein that is found in wheat. It is irritating to the gut. And our ancestors knew that, and our ancestors bred the wheat for low gluten content. We breed wheat for high gluten content because it makes the bread fluffy. Another thing is that our ancestors planted a wide variety of wheat, many different strains. Today, we plant very few. If you eat the same thing over and over again, you're more likely to develop an allergy to it. Our ancestors obviously were not planting genetically modified foods that are, were sprayed with herbicides. And what they then would do is they would plant them in the fields, they would cut the wheat, and they would leave the wheat on the sides of the field overnight. The dew would come down and sprout the wheat, which is a form of pre-digestion. So you've all seen sprouted wheat probably in the store. You've seen sprouted wheat bread and maybe you've wondered what, why is this a thing? All edible plants contain within them enzymes that inhibit their digestion. It's their protective mechanism. One form of deactivating some of those enzymes is by sprouting. So our ancestors knew that somehow, maybe intuitively, and they sprouted the wheat. They then would put the wheat through a multi-day fermentation process designed to continue to break down those inhibitory enzymes and make the nutrients in the bread most bioavailable. And so then when they baked it, you ended up with this product that at every stage of the game was bred to be most digestible and most nutrient dense. So contrast this with our modern wheat. We breed for high gluten content. We plant very few different strains. Bread, unless it's organic, is going to be GMO. And GMO very often comes sprayed with an herbicide called glyphosate. Glyphosate has been linked to a number of problems um, in the body. It is certainly an endocrine disruptor, which means that it's going to interfere with your hormone function. And for our purposes, talking about mental health nutrition, dysregulated hormones will cause problems with mood, energy, potentially sleep. But GMO foods also are problematic and inflammatory to the gut. And the gut, as we'll be talking about later, it truly is your gateway to health, and it's one of the main ways you make neurotransmitters in your body. So if you are irritating your gut, you are actively interfering with your ability to make neurotransmitters. If you are low in neurotransmitters, you are probably going to have issues with mood, sleep, energy, focus, et cetera. So that's just one snapshot of the difference between traditional wheat and the foods of commerce wheat and then the wheat that we're eating today. 
White sugar, similar, um, just like wheat. So wheat, wheat turns white because the hull is removed. The hull is what surrounds the wheat and it's brown. And it's actually where most of the nutrients are located. So when the hull is stripped from it, we have nice white bread that for some reason we've decided looks better. I don't know why, but it actually spikes our blood sugar faster and, and it doesn't contain many nutrients anymore. Similar with sugar. Sugar has uh, its own whole fascinating history. There's a lot of interesting books written about the history of sugar, but it didn't enter our diet as a refined product um, in massive quantities in, in America until the Industrial Revolution. Um, I think that it was first consumed at all in Polynesia via sugarcane, and it came through Asia. It came over to Europe via the Crusades, because you had the invading Europeans going over to the Middle East where there was some sugar. But even in Europe in the Middle, of, Middle Ages, sugar was treated as an exotic spice. It was used very rarely. So we've gone from this thing that, you know, similar to wheat, it's, it's depleting. Um, it doesn't contain nutrients. It was never designed to be part of our diet. We've gone from none of it in our diet to, you know, at this point, the average American consumes 160 pounds of sugar a year. And I'm not talking about fruit. I'm talking about refined sugar and high fructose corn syrup. So just these two things, white flour and white sugar, have had a, a strong effect on our health. And that was just in Weston A. Price's time. That doesn't even count the foods that have developed today. So I mentioned <clears throat> that the food was not the only change that was happening during the Industrial Revolution. There were a lot of sociocultural changes that were either initiated then or exacerbated by, by the Industrial Revolution. And all of them have mental health impacts. And in the spirit of zooming out and offering a systems perspective, I think it really makes sense to touch on all of these. Um, urbanization. urbanization. I mean, in all of these, I was researching studies on, on the mental health effects of them, and there were tons. Urban, urbanization affects mental health due to increased stressors such as overcrowding, pollution, violence, and reduced social support. Um, economic disparity, of course, if we're leaving the farms and going to work in a factory, some people start to get richer, some people start to get poorer. We have capitalism. We know that being poor is really stressful. We know that being poor causes depression, anxiety, insomnia, et cetera, um, as many studies show. Um, here are some nature-based ones. Lack of adequate sunlight. We're designed to be outside all day in constant contact with nature, wearing loincloths. That's how much, that's how our body is designed to absorb vitamin D. So, I think it's fair to assume that the majority of us are low in vitamin D. Sunlight boosts serotonin and vitamin D and depletion in these lead to issues with mood and energy. Disconnection from nature itself. Um, there's a whole field called eco-psychology whose goal is to reconnect people back with nature and basically connect them back up with, with the healing force that they're designed to be in content, constant contact with. Um, and there's, there's just so many studies around how beneficial contact with nature is. Look, if you think about it, this is what we were designed to do. We were designed to be living in tribes of 100 people maximum, outside in the sun and wind all day, harvesting berries, hunting, being in community, praying. We were not designed to be waking up in a box to a fluorescent light, eating food out of a box, staring at a box, that feeds us apocalyptic information from all over the world at a dizzying rate. Our nervous systems were not designed for this. So these are all reasons why I think that our, our countries and our world's mental health is in the state that it is right now. Um, sedentary behavior, erosion of social support, and excessive screen time, other big changes. So what is the result of this? Well, we therapists know sharp increase in mental health problems. And here are a couple of recent statistics from the National Institute of Mental Health. In any given year, 
one in five employed adults in the U.S. is suffering from a mental health issue. And remember, you know, a, a lot of individuals who are dealing with mental health issues need to take disability, so they are not employed. So the statistic does not even count them. Um, one in five youth between the ages of 13 and 18 is living with a severe mental health disorder. These are huge numbers. Um, and there's a way that we tend to locate these mental illnesses within the individual, like you have depression, you have anxiety. And it's like part of the reason that I wanted to zoom out at the beginning of this talk and offer you the wide angle lens is to situate the change in nutrition in this larger context of how we've become industrialized, but to situate the mental health issues that we're experiencing in the same context. I think that our clients and us, you know, when we're dealing with problems with mood and energy and focus and substance abuse, we're having normal reactions to a dysfunctional culture. And I love this quote by Krishnamurti, it is no measure of health to be well adjusted to a profoundly sick society. So in conclusion, the standard American lifestyle has a profoundly negative effect on our physical, mental, and emotional health. So what has been conventional medicine's solution to this? Well, therapy, great. But biochemically, the only mainstream solution we're offered is psychiatric medications. I want to say something here, which is if you or your client is taking a medication and you or they are finding benefit from it, great. I'm not giving this talk to try and convince you not to take medications. What I am trying to show you is another way, aside from this allopathic, one size fits all, one problem, one solution model. You're depressed, you take an SSRI. And introduce to you more of a naturopathic model, which has to do with finding the root of the problem and healing that naturally so that the symptom can resolve. So take depression. What is the root of depression? Biochemically, off the top of my head, I can think of a bunch of causes that don't have to do with low serotonin. Low thyroid, depleted catecholamines, poor gut function, poor diet, poor sleep, dysregulated blood sugar, subclinical virus, the list goes on and on. So this is what my talk is designed to do, is to give you just a little taste of what is it like to look at things from this, this more holistic naturopathic perspective and go to the root naturally. Um, is there anything else I want to say about that? No. Okay. So I'm going to offer you a quote from Kelly Brogan's book, A Mind of Your Own. Kelly Brogan is a psychiatrist. She was trained at Cornell and MIT. She's not dumb. Um, she only practices like I do now. And her book, A Mind of Your Own, focuses on women and depression, um, although it's, I mean, it's multi-layered. It's, it's fascinating for anyone who's interested in mental health nutrition in general. But she gives a lot of really interesting statistics around the use of SSRIs. 11% of Americans, 25% of whom are women in their 40s and 50s, are using antidepressants the use of which increased almost 400% in the 10 years between 98 and 2008, making the third most commonly prescribed drug across all ages. Pharmaceutical companies have been testing SSRIs for a variety of disorders, which are not necessarily related to depression. And we are spending more on antidepressants than the gross national product of more than half of the world's countries. So I know a lot of us therapists will be working with a client, say, who's depressed, who's gone through a, a huge loss, let's say, and they cannot seem to get the ground under their feet. And so maybe we talk to them about, hey, what about short term going on an SSRI for a few months, just so we can really work the therapy hard, get your social supports in place, and then you can kind of come off of it, but just to kind of give you a boost, right? And so we, we think a lot in terms of short term use. Well, the statistics bear out a different reality. 60% of people on antidepressants stay on them for more than two years and 14% for more than a decade. 
So these are often being used very long term. And there are a lot of adverse effects sometimes. Um, in its first 12 years after its initial marketing blitz, Prozac was named in over 40,000 reports of adverse effects submitted to the FDA. I know I've had clients who were depressed but not suicidal, went on an SSRI and became suicidal. I've had clients who went on an SSRI and became homicidal. Certainly sexual dysfunction is a commonly accepted side effect of SSRIs, which, which is a shame because it, it doesn't necessarily have to be that way. So now we're going to zoom in and look at mental health nutrition itself after that establishing sort of the, the large scale view, the bird's eye view. Let's look at the standard American diet. That's what we nutritionists call what a typical American eats in a day. So I'm going to invite you to take a couple of moments and just kind of reflect on what do you eat in a day? If you're a therapist, what do your clients tend to eat in a day? And then what do you think a typical American person is consuming in a day? So we'll just take a little while for that. So I can say, you know, I live in Boulder and there's a very high degree of consciousness around nutrition here. So my clients who live in Boulder have one way of eating, but I work with a lot of people who don't live in Boulder. And for them, typically the day of eating looks something like this. Breakfast is nothing or coffee or cereal or some kind of granola bar or donut and it's usually eaten hastily. Lunch may be skipped or is a sandwich. Um, and then dinner, often some kind of pasta, usually some kind of protein, maybe some kind of vegetable. And then throughout the day, a lot of sugar and caffeine. So contrast this to what you just learned about Weston A. Price and traditional diets, right? We evolved in harmony with the plants and animals around us. That's what we know how to digest and make use of. That's what we need for fuel. So the standard American diet, as you're seeing, of processed food with low nutrient density, it actually has a profoundly detrimental effect on mood, sleep, energy, and focus. And we are going to talk a little bit more in depth about what that looks like. So for the purposes of this talk, I've grouped the effects of the standard American diet into three large categories. Um, nutrient depletion and malnutrition, inflammation and gut dysbiosis, and blood sugar dysregulation. We're going to talk more about the second two later in the talk, and we're going to focus on the first one right now. So the first thing that I want to say is that being low in certain nutrients itself can cause mental health problems. And um, I'm just going to highlight a few for the sake of this talk. For example, let's take B vitamins. So there are a number of ways that B deficiency can cause problems with mood, sleep, energy, focus. The first is that B vitamins are a cofactor in making neurotransmitters. So if you don't have enough B vitamins present, it's going to be hard to make adequate neurotransmitters. Anytime you're working on making more neurotransmitters, you should be supporting with B vitamins. And that goes for if you're taking a psychiatric medication too. But the other thing is that B deficiency itself is directly connected to depression, anxiety, insomnia, night terrors, and even psychosis. And I have numerous examples of this from my practice, but I'm just gonna give you two. One is actually an interesting food history case study, and one is a case study from, from a client that I had. So in the early 1900s in the American South, there was, they found out later, an epidemic of a condition called pellagra. Pellagra is B vitamin deficiency. Why did this happen? Well, 
local food processing was being displaced to make to make way for the the production and processing of cotton and the way that local food specifically corn which was a, a very dominant crop in the south at the time was processed was in a way to liberate its B vitamin content. Corn actually has a decent, decent amount of B vitamins and depending on how you process it, you can either get to them or not. The way they were doing it then was getting to them. So as cotton production pushed out the local corn processors, the Southerners had started to have to get their corn from the Midwest. The way that corn was milled in the Midwest depleted the corn of B vitamins. So what ended up happening is that the, the Southerners had this huge epidemic of B vitamin deficiency. What does this cause? Well, a number of symptoms, including death, if you can call that a symptom, I don't know. Um, it can cause uh, dementia, aggressiveness, violence, anxiety, and psychosis. There was a huge epidemic of psychosis across the South for decades. People didn't really know why. And it wasn't until people came down from the Department of Public Health and did studies and started to fortify the food with B vitamins that things started to resolve and they could retroactively look back and go, okay, this was B vitamin deficiency. But here's an example of large scale B vitamin deficiency and subsequent significant mental health problems. So here's an example on a micro level. Um, I had a client who was in his mid twenties and he had been dealing with depression since he was born and alcoholism since his mid teens. He had tried to get sober many times, but every time he stopped drinking, his depression would return. His night terrors would return. He'd have problems sleeping. So when I saw him, I deduced that he may have a condition called pyroluria. So pyroluria, is this, this unusual genetic condition in which individuals make more, certain individuals make more pyrroles, which are a, a, by, a byproduct of a hemoglobin synthesis um, than others. Basically, if you make a lot of pyrroles, pyrroles need to be excreted by taking B vitamins and zinc and having them bind to the pyrroles and then they, they get flushed out of the body. So you, you need B vitamin and zinc to get those pyrroles out of your body. Um, individuals who make lots of pyrroles are going to be utilizing a lot of B vitamins and zinc. So they're going to be depleting themselves of B vitamins and zinc. What did we just talk about? B vitamin is very connected to mood and sleep. Um, and zinc too is zinc deficiency absolutely can impact mood. So another symptom of pyroluria is that the depression that you experience is alleviated by drinking alcohol. So when I'm working with people who are dealing with alcoholism, I'm asking them about depression, I'm asking them about depression and alcoholism in their family, whether it's alleviated by drinking alcohol, and also their ancestry, because pyroluria is more common amongst people of Native American and Western European descent. He was Irish. So, Luckily for him, he landed somewhere where he met a person that knew about pyroluria. I put him on this very simple pyroluria protocol to replenish his body with B vitamins and zinc. Sometimes this can take up to a month to work. This is one of the slower acting protocols. For him, I saw him a week later. He said, I am not depressed anymore. I'm not having night terrors. And for the first time, I am having no alcohol cravings. That's how miraculous this stuff can be. So is there anything else I want to say about B vitamins? No. Um, just a couple of other nutrients I want to highlight. Um, vitamin D, as I said, we are designed to be outside and wearing loincloths all day. That's how we get our vitamin D. Um, many of us are deficient in vitamin D. Vitamin D regulates the immune system and helps with the release of neurotransmitters. So seasonal affective disorder, which is linked to serotonin deficiency, is also linked to D deficiency. Um, another classic symptom of D deficiency is low energy. Omega-3 deficiency. Um, Omega-3 is a type of fat in our diet that we were getting in much more abundant qualities or quantities um, back in the day. And this is because 
the animals that we were consuming were eating their native diet, which included grass and bugs. When they consumed that, they were forming more of these good omega-3 fats in their flesh. We would consume that. We would have a higher ratio of omega-3 in our bodies. That's not happening today with factory farmed meats. Omega-3 deficiency is linked to depression, bipolar, schizophrenia, and dementia. Zinc deficiency, as I mentioned, vitamin C deficiency, magnesium deficiency, et cetera, can all cause mental health symptoms. How do we get these micronutrients? Through our food, right? Not through highly processed depleting foods like white flour and white sugar, but by nutrient-dense foods. Some of the most nutrient-dense foods are fruits and vegetables. You will notice that in that standard American diet that we were talking about earlier, fruits and vegetables make a very minimal appearance. The US RDA for fruits and vegetables is five to seven servings per day. A serving is half a cup or a full cup if it's leafy greens. How many of us are getting that, right? Even as a nutritionist, I don't get that sometimes. And in addition, Studies show that because of farming practices, this depletion in the soil, the depletion of the nutrient content of the soil, means that the nutrient density of the fruit and vegetable that we are consuming today is much lower than decades ago, which is why I'm actually a big advocate of foraged foods, because if you go into forests and abandoned lots and eat weeds, they're actually a lot more nutrient dense than what you can get from the store. Um, Overall, fruit and vegetable deficiency itself can also cause low energy and even things like bipolar. So I'm just going to put a little case study in here. I'm going to weave in as many stories as I can. Um, I had a client who had a bipolar diagnosis. He came into me the first session presenting as very manic. He was very sexually inappropriate. And he revealed to me that he never had fruits and vegetables. So we did a few things with his neurotransmitter balance, but really the main thing we did is we got him to start to eat smoothies, which I would have him put avocado and greens and fruit into. And I had him take an extremely powerful micronutrient supplement to replenish his body because it was so depleted. It didn't have what it, was, what it needed. By the third session, his mood was completely stable and he was totally appropriate. So this guy had severe micronutrient deficiency, and when his body started getting what it was designed to get, it started working better. So I want to, uh, to address a couple of other things in a broad-based way here, as far as the standard American diet that we touched on earlier. The lack of protein and the issue of actual depletion of nutrients. So I mentioned before that processed food not only lacks nutrients, but actually depletes the body of nutrients. So here's an example. Sugar depletes the body of magnesium. Magnesium has a number of functions in the body. One is to build strong bones, but another is for physical relaxation. It's a muscle relaxant. So someone who's eating a lot of sugar, the body is having to draw from its existing stores of magnesium to neutralize this. They're probably more likely to feel a lot of mus muscle tension, maybe body pain. And if they're getting their periods, they're more likely to have menstrual cramps. Taking magnesium for menstrual cramps can be incredibly helpful. Um, and then the lack, of, the lack of protein has a very negative impact on mental health for two reasons. One, Protein is essential for blood sugar regulation, which we'll be talking about a little more later. Um, but the other is that neurotransmitters are manufactured from protein. So if you don't have enough protein in your diet, you are not giving your body the raw material that it needs to make neurotransmitters. What is sufficient protein? That depends on you, it depends on your biochemistry, your blood type, your age, your activity level, whether you're pregnant, all kinds of things. I can say that for me, um, I'm pretty active. I, I work out just about every day. I'm 110 pounds, I'm 42, and I need at least 15 grams of protein per meal, and I also have protein snacks. 
So this actually comes back to other practices that I do with my clients, which is teaching them how to listen to their body to hear what it needs. And you can start to learn to hear how much protein your body needs. So um, as I said, I want to leave in as many stories as I can throughout this talk. And I'm going to give you a case study of actually the mother of a client who then became a client. Um, I had a, a client who was a young woman in early recovery from, I think, meth and had really phenomenal results with mental health nutrition. And her mom came to a talk that I gave. After the talk, it was a similar talk to this. She came up to me and she said, I think I need to see you because I might need some help with nutrition. And I've had anxiety and depression and low energy as long as I can remember. And I said, great, come in. So she came in for the first session. I always start with the gut. I always start with digestion because it truly is the gateway to health. And if your gut is not working well, nothing is going to work well. But for her, her gut was kind of okay, but I knew that where we needed to start was her diet. So speaking of the standard American diet, she for breakfast would have a muffin or a bagel. Lunch would be pasta. Dinner would be bread and some kind of protein and maybe vegetable. So I explained to her all these things that I'm explaining to you. And um, we talked about eating nutrient-dense food and how your body needs certain foods as fuel. And we talked about healthy substitutions because I don't like to tell people that they can't eat something. So this isn't about like, don't have muffins. But I said to her, you know, instead of having a, like a muffin that you bought from Safeway every day, if you really like those, what about having those once in a while, but the normal muffin, I'm gonna send you a website with paleo muffin recipes and you can make this muffin out of coconut flour and eggs and honey and baking soda and salt and blueberries. So nutrient dense, like such good fats, good protein, so satiating, right? Um, I talked to her about making smoothies. I talked to her about how about instead of the pasta with that, with that noodles in it that are made from uh, wheat, which is very irritating to your gut, how about brown rice pasta and putting lots of veggies in it and getting some like meatballs made of some kind of protein in there. She was really motivated because she was feeling really bad. And so she took my suggestions to heart and we met a week later and she, and she said, I, I'm fine. My mood is fine and my energy is totally what I need to get me through the day now. So you may be sitting here right now saying, this sounds too good to be true. It is not. Is this the magic bullet for everyone? No. Is it vastly helpful for the vast majority of the hundreds of clients I've seen? Yes. Why? Because it's your biochemistry. You can change that in seconds or minutes if you just start giving your body what it needs. So, Here's principle number two. Um, blood sugar dysregulation is often at the root of depression, anxiety, irritability, substance cravings, including sugar, low energy, and poor focus. And I'm going to teach you why. Remember, this is going to be middle school science level, so don't get worried. So if you eat something, your blood sugar goes up, right? We, we kind of all know that. Um, if you eat a simple carbohydrate that is soda, bread, candy, pasta, your blood sugar is going to spike. If you eat a complex carbohydrate that is brown rice, apple, broccoli, your blood sugar will go up, but not as drastically. However, if your blood sugar is spiking, this is not a natural state in the body because, again, if you think from an evolutionary perspective, when were our ancestors doing this? Very rarely. So the body doesn't know what to do and it overcompensates and it causes a crash. When else does your blood sugar crash? When you go too long without eating, when you don't eat enough, and when you don't eat enough protein and fat. So here we've got that low blood sugar. And how do you feel when your blood sugar is low? Typically, people tell me they feel that they have low energy, poor focus, poor motivation. Some people feel depressed and pessimistic. I, I do sometimes. 
And this is not an adaptive state for the body to be in. So the body then fires adrenaline. How do you feel when your adrenaline's going? Typically, people feel anxious, irritable, sometimes even angry and violent. And something else that happens when your adrenaline spikes is that your prefrontal cortex shuts off because you're in fight or flight, right? So your brain doesn't need to be working. So you lose access to reason, logic, and impulse control, which is why when people have low blood sugar, they do things and say things that they normally wouldn't. There's a whole fascinating book called Food and Behavior, which is on the resources slide at the end of this talk. And it's written by a woman who ran the program for people who are on parole for decades. She saw again and again a link between violence and eating junk food because of the blood sugar roller coaster. People's blood sugar would crash, their adrenaline would spike. For these people, their, their irritability would actually be at the level of violence and they would commit violence. She put them all on a diet designed to stabilize their blood sugar. And it was a diet like we're talking about, nutrient dense, whole foods, protein and fat. Um, when they ate this, their recidiv recidivism rate dropped to zero. They had no violence. So this is powerful, powerful stuff. How do you regulate the blood sugar? Eating enough, eating frequently, and eating adequate protein and fat because that is what keeps your blood sugar stable. So thinking about those dysregulated blood sugar symptoms, what does that sound like? This is, people get diagnosed for anxiety for this. People get diagnosed for depression. Substance cravings can happen with the blood sugar drops. Some people in the recovery community say um, the number one cause of relapse is a, is a skipped meal. Um, ADD, ADHD. Does, does your child have ADHD or are they eating sugary cereal for breakfast and having a blood sugar roller coaster and having a reaction to that? So I want to offer a couple of case studies about blood sugar. Um, the first is someone who I'll call Susie, and she came in to me saying, I have really bad sugar cravings, which people often come to me for. Um, and I don't start off asking about emotions with this. I, as, as I mentioned earlier, I start off with the biochemistry. And I said to her, what are you eating during the day? And she was saying, well, I wake up in the morning and I take my stimulants because I can't get going without them. I don't eat breakfast, I'll have a little lunch, I'll have a regular dinner, and then I end up eating a bunch of sugar. And I said to her, I don't think you have sugar cravings, I think you're hungry. Because the body is hardwired to need a certain amount of food every day and a certain number of nutrients every day. And this is why diets don't work. If you try and restrict food, your body's gonna force you to end up eating. And it's usually not food that you would have preferred to eat. So I explained to her this, and I explained to her blood sugar dysregulation. And she had really been indoctrinated into that 1970s, 1980s, like low fat, low cal is healthy dogma, which is totally wrong. And she agreed to try my approach. And I said, I don't think you're going to need stimulants either once you actually give your body the fuel that it needs. So she started eating a nutrient-dense breakfast and a nutrient-dense lunch. Guess what? Sugar cravings dropped and she did not need stimulants anymore. Makes sense. Another case study that I'd like to offer has to do with a client of mine who had a bipolar diagnosis and um, was in early recovery from methamphetamine. He, I don't really know how you can get a bipolar diagnosis if you're actively using meth but he, he did. And um, he said, even when he wasn't using meth, he had major mood swings. He also had a huge sweet tooth and was vegan and was not a healthy vegan. He wasn't really attending to his protein and fat. He was junk food vegan. So he was at this substance abuse rec recovery center that I talked about. And I had complete control over the food that the clients in residential ate. And while they were used to being in early recovery and eating junk food and soda and energy drinks, they were all very unpleasantly surprised to come in and find that the sweetest thing in the kitchen was honey and berries. 
um, and that instead of energy drinks, they would be having green tea. He did not like that. But he started learning about how to make really excellent vegan smoothies with brown rice protein powder um, and making beans and rice with lots of vegetables in them, really working on regulating his blood sugar. And at the end of his, he stayed for six months total, but after a couple of weeks, it was really clear that his mood was fine. His mood was fine and his mood roller coaster was due somewhat to his drug use, but you know, in his periods of sobriety due to blood sugar dysregulation. So now we're going to talk a little bit about digestive function. Um, and as I mentioned, I actually always start with this. Um, the gut is the gateway to health. You are what you eat, but you really are what you absorb. So how, how does how we're living in the modern day impact how our guts are working? Here's your principle three. Impaired gut microbiome and function almost inevitably causes problems with mood, sleep, energy, and or cravings. Now, just like everything else I've already talked about, there are books upon books and courses upon courses on this very subject. I'm just gonna kind of take you through a little 101 simple explanation of some of this. What does your digestive system do? It is responsible for digestion and absorption of food and synthesis of nutrients. Remember earlier we were talking about being low in certain nutrients can itself cause mental health problems. Being low in food and not absorbing your food is going to keep you hungry and keep you having cravings. Your digestive system is responsible for synthesis of neurotransmitters. Up to 90% of the serotonin that the body can make is made in the gut. So why, if we think someone is low in serotonin, are we giving them a pill to cause their brain to fire more rather than looking at their gut function and going, whoa, that gut's messed up and healing the gut so that it can make maximum serotonin. I've done this with many clients and it works. And the digestive system is also responsible for the immune response, including the inflammatory response. Now, even conventional doctors today are talking about the connection between inflammation and autoimmune disease, the connection between inflammation and depression but they're not talking about what's causing the inflammation. And then their conclusion is take anti-inflammatories. This approach is like a fire alarm is going off and then you're just taking the batteries out. If you are having a symptom, it is indicating that there is an imbalance in your system. So find the imbalance, heal that, and the symptom will calm down. So in this case, I'm gonna tell you a tiny bit about why we have inflammation in the body, which has to do with our standard American lifestyle and what's, what's inflaming the gut. We'll be talking about that in a slide or two. But I'm also going to talk about why inflammation is causing mood issues. And here's two sixth grade slash middle school explanations. One, there is an enzyme that helps in the conversion of dopamine or no, uh, L-tyrosine to dopamine, and L-tryptophan to serotonin. In other words, this, this enzyme helps you make neurotransmitters, right? This same enzyme is also part of the detoxification process and helps defuse some inflammatory chemicals. So if the level of inflammatory chemicals gets too high, this enzyme gets pulled in as an emergency firefighter and needs to work over there, and it doesn't leave enough left over to help with the conversion into, of neurotransmitters. Does that make sense? So you're gonna end up with low neurotransmitters and that is going to cause mental health problems. The other way that inflammation in the body can cause depression is that it leads to not only leaky gut, which is a whole other thing that we'll talk about um, in my certification program, um, but also leaky blood brain barrier. Um, when there is a leaky blood brain barrier, toxins can get in through the brain and that can cause depression. For example, some of the bacteria that come from SIBO, small intestine bacterial overgrowth, can cause depression. 
So why, why is there inflammation in the gut? Why is there leaky guts? Um, what, what is, what is happening here? I mean, did our ancestors have this? No, it's caused by the standard American lifestyle, processed foods. When we put things in our body that our body hasn't evolved to recognize, it becomes inflamed. Antibiotic cause dysregulation in your gut microbiome. Birth control too, it's linked in study after study to depression. Non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, which are being recommended to calm inflammation. Alcohol is inflammatory to the gut. Smoking is inflammatory to the gut and stress. So as I say, in other words, standard American lifestyle. So how many of us as therapists are talking about um, our client's digestion? I mean, I am at, at every session, you know, every first session, I'm talking to my clients about their poop, but they quickly learn why. These are all indicators of digestive problems. Um, constipation, you should be having one dark, well-formed bowel movement every day. The vast majority of people who I work with on mental health nutrition do not. Um, diarrhea, we should only have diarrhea if we have uh, a bug, a stomach bug, or we eat something that doesn't agree with us, or we have food poisoning. Bloating, I didn't even know what bloating was till my late 20s. I thought, oh, after you eat, your stomach sticks out. That's how it goes. No. Gas, you should not have frequent or malodorous gas. Pain, you should not have pain in your gut. Um, bad taste in the mouth and bad breath. This is one end of your digestive tract. If your gut bacteria is out of balance, if food is not being digested and it's just sitting there fermenting in the gut, the effects of that are going to travel up here. Skin issues. Your, your digestive system is the main way that you detox. There are a number of ways that detox processes happen in there. If it is not doing its job correctly, another organ will take over. The majority of time, that's the skin. So very often with people who have issues with mental health, they also have gut problems and skin problems. Um, acne, eczema, psoriasis, hives, we heal that by healing the gut. And it's been a nice, happy side effect for a lot of my clients. They didn't expect that by coming to me, their acne or their psoriasis would resolve, but it does. Asthma, same thing as the skin. Um, if the digestive system's not detoxing properly, sometimes the lungs take over. Allergies, this has to do with leaky gut. When, when your gut bacteria is not lining your intestinal wall correctly, leaving holes, the intestinal wall is very fragile and sometimes microscopic bits of food poke out and enter the rest of the body. And that's then attacked by the immune system as a foreign invader, which is an allergic reaction. And that's an inflammatory reaction. So your birthright really is to have all of these be zero, one, or two. And if they're not, there are absolutely natural ways of getting you and your clients there. I've done it many, many times. So two last stories um, before we conclude um, about heal how healing the gut can really help with mood and other mental health issues. Um, I had a client come to me who is about 30, who had dealt with depression for a long time, who had been smoking for a long time and tried to quit and never could sustain that because she would have strong nicotine cravings. She actually was very knowledgeable about nutrition. We didn't really need to tweak her food, but her gut was not working well at all, you know, based on the assessment I gave her. So when someone is craving a substance, I always ask what feeling they're looking for because that helps me understand what neurotransmitter they might be low in because they're going to look for the substance that fires that neurotransmitter that gives them that feeling. In her case, we deduced that she wanted the serotonin in the nicotine, uh, the serotonin that the nicotine fires rather. It made sense because her gut was probably not making very much because it was really not working very well. So first week, all we did was a very strong gut healing protocol. And she came back a week later and said, my mood is fine and I stopped smoking four days ago and I haven't had cravings. And I said, awesome, uh, email me in a week and tell me how things are going. She emailed me in the week, same thing, I'm still not smoking and my mood is fine. 
And I, I think I heard from her a few months later and she said, yep, I'm still good. And I've, I've been able to stop cigarettes, which is really cool. So it's, it's good for people to know often that their cravings aren't about like lack of willpower. It's actual biochemical dysregulation. But if you know how to balance those neurotransmitters naturally, that can stop your cravings. One other case study I want to offer has to do with a client of mine who has an eating disorder. And it's so common with eating disorders that people will be obsessing about food, weight, body image, right? And as therapists, we're just treating the obsessing as an emotional issue. Obsessive thoughts is a classic low serotonin symptom. And for her, like so many of my clients, her digestive system was working very poorly. So when we got it working better, she reported that instead of weighing herself five times a day, she was down to one without even really trying. She said that she used to be very rigid about food and if she would go downstairs and uh, someone else, because she lived with her family, had eaten the apple she was planning to eat, she would freak out and obsess about, oh my God, what else to eat? She had that morning gone down and the food she was planning to eat was not there and she thought, oh, okay and was casual and calm and just made something else. So her obsessing dropped significantly just by working on her gut to make more serotonin. So I wanna leave you with my understanding, which is your, the bottom line is that your birthright on this planet on a typical day is to have decent mood, decent sleep, decent energy, decent focus, decent digestion, no headaches, no cramps. In other words, you should feel okay. If you have a symptom, which all of these things I just listed, if you have insomnia and anxiety and depression and constipation and acne, these are symptoms. That means there is an imbalance. And the vast majority of time, this imbalance can be rectified using natural approaches. So what did we talk about? We start with healing the gut because you are what you absorb, stabilizing blood sugar, and focusing on what our ancestors ate, what we're designed to eat, that whole nutrient-dense food without being restrictive. If, if uh, your gut is working about well and your blood sugar is stable and the majority of what you're eating is that good fuel, you can have a little bit of whatever you want. You can indulge sometimes. But just so that you don't think that it's that simple, I will say these approaches will help the vast majority of your clients the majority of the time. And there's more. There's a whole world of learning how to support neurotransmitter production with supplements. Um, it's amazing, it's called amino acid therapy. Um, you may consider if you're working with a client and you've done these different things um, that there may be an issue of hormone imbalance. Um, low thyroid function may be an issue and so on. Um, I will say that a lot of the pieces that I've given you here fall under the heading of psychoeducation. So you can easily talk to your client, for instance, about blood sugar and how blood sugar dysregulation can cause that depression and those sugar cravings that they're talking about. If you start to move into the world of offering them more nuanced suggestions or offering them protocols, it is really important to get specialized training in that due to scope of practice issues. Um, and purely for you know, knowing better and being a better practitioner and for considerations of liability. So I'm offering, uh, starting April 1st, a course called Mental Health Nutrition Found for Psychotherapist Foundations. It is a five-week 101 course, um, meets an hour and a half per week. The first hour is lecture, the last 30 minutes is discussion. It's being offered through the Addiction Nutrition Academy, and you can go online to it um, and click under, uh, I think it's trainings, and click Mental Health Nutrition for Therapists Foundations, and you can register for it right then and there. Because you are on this webinar tonight, I am happy to offer you a savings off of the usual investment. So we're, we're asking 575 for the course, but if you sign up for the course by noon Colorado time tomorrow, we are happy to give you a $75 credit, meaning all six weeks or all five weeks of the program 
will be $500, which is an, I think incredible for, for learning these things that can vastly help and transform the lives of, of probably all of your clients. Um, the Addiction Nutrition Academy also offers more advanced and technical courses if you're interested and like to geek out in more of a like hardcore science-y way. So I strongly recommend checking out the rest of their website. If you want to geek out on your own, these are some of my Bibles, and I'm not going to go through them one by one just for the sake of time in case anybody has questions. Um, but yes, these are all amazing books in their own way, and there's more. So I think that's all I want to say for tonight, and we can move.